What's the juice fam? We are in such a groove, such a flow right now. If you are watching from our new YouTube channel where we're posting the full video and audio files of all of these episodes, What's the Juice podcast channel, you will see that I am in our brand new podcast home studio, which is in my basement, which my husband, Nicholas, lovingly built by hand for me with his brothers and friends. And everything is just feeling so good, so aligned. The guests of this season are incredible. And I have another wildly intelligent, wonderful practitioner coming at you guys today. So today I'm going to be chatting with Lauren Papanos, who is a registered dietitian, a hormone specialist, and a sports performance expert. And she is the practitioner, the resource to go to if you are on your strength training, muscle building, hormone balancing journey, but you have no idea what the heck you should be eating before and after your workouts. It can be very confusing. We're in our high protein era. And yet, what does that actually look like in a pre-workout and post-workout meal? How many carbs should you be eating? Should you go low carb like everyone on the internet says you should? We're gonna break everything down in today's episode where Lauren explains exactly how to eat before and after your workouts and why those meals should look totally different from how you eat the rest of the day. This is something I had never heard before. You actually wanna be eating lower fat around your workouts and load up on the healthy fats in the second portion of the day. And she is going to go so deep and get into the nitty gritty with actionable tips for PCOS, hypothyroidism, and so much more. She's going to break down the four different types of PCOS. She's going to explain why your thyroid needs carbs, but how your thyroid hormone sensitivity can change if you go on a low carb or keto diet. She's going to talk about topical therapies for your thyroid, which we've never had anyone talk about before. Everything from red light therapy to topical glutathione that you can put over your thyroid. She's going to explain a lot about mitochondrial health from a nutrient perspective and talk about ways to get those key nutrients into your diet as well as key minerals. And we're going to go into a lot of the exercise science. This is for any woman out there who's starting to exercise but is confused as how to do it most effectively, not only for your cardiovascular health, but for your muscle journey. And she's going to explain why you should be doing cardio and resistance training on totally different days, how you want to plan your ideal exercise split, And she's gonna give us all the juicy info that we've been craving surrounding how to work out and push our bodies, but also not mess with our adrenal sex and thyroid hormones. Most of all, like I've been saying, she is an amazing practitioner that you guys can utilize as a resource, as a practitioner, if she's the right fit for you. And she also has workout plans and resources on her site that, again, I would feel so comfortable recommending to you guys so that you have an action plan and someone to work with after this episode is done. And that's why this season makes me so happy. Now, like I said, this season of What's the Juice, we're not doing any external ad sponsors. My company, My Herbal Formulas, Organic Livia, is taking care of every single cost associated, taking care of every single human that is on the team that goes into making this show. And so if you do want to support the show and support the resources and costs involved in making the show, you can head to my site, organiclivia.com, and purchase one of the formulas that we talked about in this episode. We actually talked about three or four different formulas. And most of all, we talked a ton about increasing your mineral intake in this episode and how important that is for your hormones, for your thyroid, and even for displacing heavy metals. A really easy way to do this is using a beautifully potent, strong extraction of mineral rich plants, like the plants found in my Mighty Minerals tincture. That's why I made this, because we have so many mineral gaps in our diet. We combined some of the most nourishing mineral rich herbs on the planet, like alfalfa and oat straw and nettle leaf that are known for their trace mineral content. The minerals in this easy to take delicious tincture support your cellular health, your energy, your vitality, and again, those mineral gaps in your diet. They also support immune function and cellular hydration. My Mighty Minerals tincture is loved by parents, adults, and kids alike. We originally designed it for kids and then so many adults loved it and it gave them so much more energy and they started feeling better. So now it's just part of our permanent line. And you can think of that formula as plants in a bottle. 
But instead of being a greens powder that contains things like spinach, we actually went to our herbal greens, our wild nourishing plants like nettle leaf, because we find that wild plants and herbs tend to retain some of their wild instincts and mineral diversity better than some of our classically cultivated friends. The other formulas that can support you related to hormone and digestive concerns that we specifically touch on in this episode are Thyropro. Thyropro is my multivitamin, multimineral, thyroid-specific adaptogen blend. And this super comprehensive formula not only contains those vitamin and mineral building blocks that are essential for the production of proper thyroid hormone, but also contains these adaptogens and liver supporting plants that are crucial to help with some of those metabolic roadblocks that can prevent us from properly converting and using thyroid hormone. We took all of the thyroid complaints into mind when formulating this, cold hands and feet, sluggish digestion, low energy levels. So it's a really comprehensive formula with herbals that can support you with each of these pieces of thyroid dysfunction. And of course, it contains thyroid-loving adaptogens like Luthro, Shizandra, and Ashwagandha to assist those of us that are feeling depleted and worn out. The last two formulas we mentioned in this episode are Bloat BFF and Glucobitters. Bloat BFF is our SIBO-safe bloating capsule that is fast-acting and soothing for even the most sensitive stomachs. It's a blend of plants, enzymes, and even a spore-forming probiotic that actually help to address microbiome diversity, microbiome health, and also reduce discomfort, gas, and bloating. After eating the foods that you love and the foods that you want to be incorporating into your diet, like beans and cruciferous veggies that can support your hormones, but be very difficult to digest. And of course, the queen glucobitters, that is our number one best-selling formula. It's been such a star in our line since we first came out with it. And it makes so much sense because so many humans, so many women are struggling with insulin resistance and PCOS. And this is a metabolic vinegar tincture, like an herbal vinegar tincture to go that you can put in your bag and take with you that will help to balance your blood sugar and keep glucose spikes to a minimum. Also, when you are eating the foods that you love. The herbs in this blend are immensely helpful for insulin sensitivity and lessening cravings and help with that gut-brain satiation connection. And it's really an Eastern meets Western solution to the blood sugar roller coaster that so many of us are on, especially when we're dealing with hormone conditions like PCOS. Before any carb heavy meals, just take one to two full droppers in a bit of water and have that before your meal. And if you forget to take it before your meal, you can always have it afterwards as kind of like a digestive and it will still help to support your glucose response to that meal. So if any of these formulas resonate with you, if while you're listening to the show and while I break down the formulas in the context of the information that we're sharing and you feel like, hey, that's a tool that I could really use, you can go to organicolivia.com and use the code hormones15 for 15% off any of those four. So Mighty Minerals, Thyropro, Bloat BFF, and Glucobitters. And this code will be good for the next month and the offer will end in April. So that is the plan. Whenever there's relevant herbal tools that I can support you with that go along with an episode, I'm going to provide a discount code for you guys. And if you feel called to try one of those formulas and support the show, that would be absolutely amazing. Of course, you can also rate the show on iTunes and just spread the word or post in your stories and just help us get the education out there as well. Enjoy the episode and thank you for coming along for the ride of this season. Welcome to the show. How are you going to grow if you don't know where you're growing from? Whoa. This is the scientific proof of grace. That's wild. What is healthy to you? I just moved towards liberation. Let's get juicy. Let's get juicy. And welcome to the show, Lauren. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be on. It's so nice to speak with another dietitian. As I was just telling you, I've had a lot of dietitians on the show lately because I feel that you guys are such a balanced, nuanced field. You know how to work with people one-on-one -on -one consistently in this relationship basis, instead of just what you were saying is just giving people labs and saying, okay, here's your diagnosis, but we don't know how to implement them. Totally. Yeah. And I think that even sometimes patients will get labs and their doctor might say, you need to eat more protein or you need to resistance train, but then the patient doesn't know how to implement those things, right? They don't know all the nuances of 
well, like you said earlier, what do you do if you eat protein and then you get constipated and now you've got high estrogen levels, right? Or, well, what type of resistance training? How much? What's the right balance? So I really think that we're able to help walk that patient through what that journey looks like to be able to get to those goals. You know, every healthcare professional has their place. I'm so grateful for my doctor who did the digging into my labs and my symptoms and was able to tell me, yeah, you're insulin resistant, you're pre-diabetic, here's what you got to do. But it wasn't until I started working with a sports dietitian, actually, which is how you started. And yeah. we're going to talk about that one-on-one. I worked with Lulu, the functional nutritionist on Instagram. She's amazing. Um, but I had weekly calls with her and that was the game changer for me. And really what I want to do with this season of the podcast, as I was saying, saying is put folks on my platform who you guys listening can then go to as patients and as clients and build a relationship with so that you can actually put this advice into your real life in a way that is customized to you instead of just taking blanket advice. Yeah, absolutely. And that's great. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit more perhaps about your background and how you work with patients before we get into the nitty gritty of your philosophy and the education? Yeah, totally. So I went to school and I went on a competitive cheer scholarship. I grew up a gymnast and then uh, kind of got a scholarship to go cheer in college. And so um, during my freshman year of college, found nutrition, found out you could be a registered dietitian. I was like, that's really awesome. And so started studying that. And um, through that really just became obsessed and in love with both marrying functional nutrition with sports performance. I was like, this is so cool, this bridge between the two. And so when I was finishing up my dietetic internship, deciding where I wanted to start in my career as a dietitian, I was like, do I go functional medicine or do I go sports performance? So I said, let's just try and see what happens. And so I got offered into a fellowship and then that led into getting you know, a job. And so I worked in collegiate athletics for about six years and worked at different division one universities, uh, UCLA was where I spent most of my time. And during that time, I was also building my private practice on the functional medicine side of things. And I had the privilege during that time to also do a lot of research because I was working at UCLA as a sports performance dietitian. And so we were actually researching hormone conditions like female athlete triad. And so we were just seeing panels and panels of labs and hundreds of athletes where we were looking at things like their testosterone, their growth hormone, their estrogen levels, their thyroid hormones. And then I was helping them clinically be able to to make the nutrition recommendations. And so eventually I finally decided, you know, after spending a few years in that field, I want to bridge both of these into my own practice. Like there's a way to be able to help women that are high performers that maybe aren't athletes, but want to perform at a high level in business or want to stay active, want to resistance train and work out often, just like I do, um, that are also trying to figure out what's going on with their hormones and maybe dealing with these hormone conditions. And so that was really how I stepped into my private pack my private practice where I am today, uh, where we're working with women who are dealing with things like PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, helping them be able to really find the one-on-one support, the answers, the tools around how to improve symptoms, how to reverse their condition, how to manage their symptoms and their disease better so that they can really like show up at the as the highest version of themselves every day. That is my dream dietitian, someone who bridges sports medicine and functional medicine because I believe every woman should be an athlete and we are all athletes yeah. and we should all be able to feel like athletes. We should all be able to feel so capable and say, yeah, I could go run one or two miles easy. My cardiovascular fitness is there or I feel comfortable in a gym. I can lift weights because that's what's going to take us through life with maximum mobility and health and insulin sensitivity and all the things. So yeah, all women are athletes. That's my message. And so you help them get there and build their athletic performance with the right foods. So I want to ask when you were working with your collegiate athlete clients, were you able to actually make shifts in those hormone imbalances, perhaps that you were seeing with their estrogen, testosterone and growth hormone with food alone? Or did you also use botanicals? Yeah, so you are limited in that scope with NCAA uh, regulations around supplementation. So we actually did use professional grade supplements. So we use like Pure Encapsulations, which is like a pretty good like professional grade brand. And like most Division One schools aren't using that. They're using you know like really low quality supplements like Nature Made, right? And so you know we weren't using any type of like ashwagandhas or uh, L-theanine, anything like that because of NCAA regulations. But we were using things like vitamin D and magnesium 
magnesium and a lot of mineral type complexes, right? So um, we were doing a lot of that support and then definitely on the nutrition side for sure. And, you know, I had a handful of athletes on my caseload every month that I was working with that had no menstrual cycle or that had PCOS despite training hours and hours per week and was helping them reverse these conditions and get their menstrual cycle back because it's very problematic for someone that's performing or trying to train at a high level to not have a menstrual cycle. Like if you don't have a menstrual cycle, you're not making adequate estrogen and testosterone. And these are bone building hormones. You need those to protect your bone. And so then an athlete presents with higher risk of injury. They're not able to recover optimally or build the strength that they need because they don't have that hormonal profile that's really needed to be able to get through and recover from their training that they're doing. It almost feels counterintuitive to hear you say that some of these high-performing athletes were suffering from PCOS because often we have this picture of metabolic dysfunction leading to PCOS. Often PCOS folks are experiencing a bit of insulin resistance. They're having some extra weight that they're carrying, but there is this phenotype of lean PCOS as Mm -hmm. well. So can you talk a bit about that? And then I know that your recommendations were going to be highly customized and tailored to each individual client, but perhaps you can share some of the overarching food and lifestyle changes that you had those PCOS clients make. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, there is a phenotype. There's really four different types of PCOS that we know. There's 70% of women with PCOS are insulin resistant, or there is insulin resistance at the core that's driving some of the high androgens that come with PCOS. But there's also quite a bit of women that have PCOS where it might be adrenal in origin, and the adrenal glands are the real soul site of the androgen levels. Um, it can also be induced post birth control if they've come off birth control, which in young 20s, many women are on birth control, maybe even coming off of it based off of their symptoms they're experiencing. And then there also is another type of PCOS called PCOS inflammatory, which is less common, but a lot of times is autoimmune in origin. So the person might be having some inflammation and may have the early stages of something like Hashimoto's. And then that's actually what is driving the PCOS and the elevated androgens. So there can be a lot of different causes of it. Um, And yeah, and even training at that level, there can be things that they're doing through training that are actually driving the PCOS. PCOS. And I think that a lot of times people think that because someone's an athlete, that they also have really immaculate internal health. But I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that a lot of athletes that are putting their body under that physiological stress every day don't have immaculate internal health. And that's why it's so hard to judge a book by its cover because that person might look like the pinnacle of health, but internally their body is really struggling. And so when it comes to treatment recommendations, we really focus on with PCOS athletes was what does your intake look like around training and what should it look like in the hours outside of training? Because I think that that's a really easy way to be able to optimize that insulin sensitivity, right? Is if we can focus on, okay, you need carbohydrates and protein in optimal ranges for your training, you know, adaptation that we're trying to create. And so we're going to make sure that you have adequate carbohydrate prior and post training when you're most insulin sensitive, but in the hours outside of that training window, that's where we might want to focus more so on blood sugar balance, really focusing on mineral intake, antioxidants that are going to help the cells be more responsive to that insulin and really help and ultimately improve the PCOS management and the androgen production. So when you're saying pre and post, were you kind of optimizing, okay, I want you to intake X amount of grams of carbs and protein an hour before your workout and X amount of grams of carbs and protein an hour afterwards. And then the rest of the day, just eat really balanced meals, but you kind of want to bolster that intake before and after. A lot of those young girls, they're in their early twenties. So I try to not focus too much on like grams of anything or calories because there still can be potential for more of a disordered relationship with food to happen in those years because your brain is still really developing right? So we focus more so on really teaching them what is a good carbohydrate and what is the right amount of it that you should be consuming alongside protein for this type of training session that you're doing. And then how does that vary based off of if you have strength training this day versus if you have practice this day or at this time, because a lot of times they're training twice per day, right? So we did focus on that a lot. And then yeah, outside of those training meals, it was really prioritizing how do you build the proper plate for optimal blood sugar response? Response for the right minerals, you know, the foods that are going to provide you the anti-inflammatories, the minerals that are going to help you make and convert hormones like we want to. 
And then anti-inflammatory fats, I think is really essential too, because I think that's what a lot of people are doing wrong is that they're eating way too much fat around their workouts. And that's a big issue that's going to slow down their ability to digest, which is then going to take that blood flow away from the muscles and bring it into the gut. And so really focusing on what you're eating outside should almost look exact opposite of what you're eating before and after your workout. Can you give a tangible example? Yeah. So a lot of people might have a banana with almond butter before my workout, but what they don't realize is that that almond butter is actually slowing down the digestion of the glucose and fructose that's in the banana. And we don't want that because it could take a couple hours for that almond butter to really digest. And we need immediate fuel for a workout. And we don't want that blood flow going from our muscles during exercise to our gut. We want all that blood flow staying in our muscles because that's where you're going to get the best performance. So we really want to focus on is getting in those anti-inflammatory fats. I always say about two to three hours outside of the training window, because we also know that anti-inflammatory fats like omega-3s and such, that they can hinder the training adaptation if they are ingested too close to training. Because with like resistance training, for example, you want an acute inflammatory response for that muscle to break down, for your ability to recover. And if you're mega dosing with a ton of fish oil right after you get done with that workout, you could actually be impairing that adaptation that you're trying to get from the workout. And so prioritizing it in the hours outside would be more beneficial. So if you work out in the morning, perhaps taking your fish oil in the evening is a better approach. I've never heard that. Any antioxidant, any anti-inflammatory, because with antioxidants such as like acai berry or camu camu, any of these really potent antioxidant foods, it's the same thing. Vitamin C, right? Antioxidant. Um, What on the other end, which is more with the aerobic system, where Mm -hmm. they actually can inhibit the training adaptation on the cardiovascular system if you have a high dose of antioxidants right after a training session. So no matter what kind of training you're doing, whether you're going for a run or you're lifting weights or you're doing a Pilates class, that's pretty high intensity. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid too much fat in that window. And you also want to avoid taking your boatload of supplements of your vitamin C, (laughs) your fish oil, your CoQ10, all the antioxidants. You want to take those in the hours afterwards. So perhaps in the evening, if you're working on the morning or vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I think that's a really good point because I think in the nutrition world, people can get a bit dogmatic of, is a low fat diet best? Is a high fat diet best? Is a low carb diet ideal? And it's actually kind of eating within the frameworks of those quote diets at different points in the day, depending on your goals. That is such a cool way to think about it. And um, for me, that also changed the game. I now make a protein oatmeal in the morning that has a very low amount of fat in it. It's like oats and protein powder and some chia seeds and whatnot, but it has non-fat Greek yogurt and almond milk. So it's very high in carbs, very high in protein, fuels my workouts. The fat is not slowing down the digestion of the carbohydrates. Same afterwards, I have a quick carb, quick protein. Mm -hmm. And then at night I'll have fatty fish or avocado or steak that has a little bit more fat on it. And it's, it actually is such a good tip that we've never had anyone say on the show before. So thank you so much. I'm glad you're doing it intuitively though. That's, that's great. I guess because I got into a little bit of the bodybuilding vibe. Cause there's a lot of, that's the question I actually had for you. There's a lot of things that the bodybuilding world, the nineties, the two thousands actually got right in terms of that chicken, broccoli, uh, brown rice diet. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of things that they got wrong because it was a lot of men who were just eating this way. And maybe they didn't even need as many healthy fats as women for their hormones. Yeah. So I'm just going to go right into that. (laughs) What did the bodybuilders diet get right? And what did they get wrong? Well, I think they got right that you need protein to be able to help recover your muscles from training and to be able to create an anabolic state to where you can grow muscle, right? They also got right that the bodybuilding diet is predominantly high in carbohydrate and low in fat. And why that works for them is from a bodybuilding perspective, right? Because it probably doesn't work. And I know it doesn't work on all metrics of health, right? Like we know that hormonal dysfunction happens a lot in bodybuilders, especially when they're in the end stages of cutting because it is a very low fat diet and we need fat for hormones. But with the carbohydrates, they typically have more muscle mass bodybuilders, which means that they have a greater capacity to dispose of glucose, of carbohydrate. They have greater insulin sensitivity. And so they are able to intake a higher amount of carbohydrate and then they're able to utilize those carbohydrates 
before and after exercise to really get the maximum performance from the workouts that they're doing. But one thing that we know is that when you compare carbohydrate to fat intake, your body is going to have more preferential abilities to store excess fat when you are in a eucaloric state. So basically when you're meeting your caloric needs, your body's more preferred source is fat to store. You store about 90% of excess fat. Uh, We only store about 70 to like 80% of excess carbohydrate. So if you eat a excess of carbohydrate, there's going to be a lower likelihood of you storing that as excess body fat. And so that's what essentially why they were able to see such dramatic changes to body fat um, and also increased muscle because they were essentially doing everything they needed to be able to support the lowest amount of body fat and everything they needed to be able to support the maximum amount of muscle through protein, right? So those I think were the two really, uh, you know, great things that were happening. But as I mentioned, with the low fat diet, you're going to see a lot of hormone disruption happen. And that's where it goes back to is like, just because someone always looks good on the outside doesn't necessarily mean that their internal health is functioning optimally. And a lot of bodybuilders, when they get on stage, they look ripped and super lean, but their body hormonally is in a really, um, you know, diminished state because they just don't have adequate fats and fat soluble vitamins to be able to help them make and convert hormones. This is where the marriage of sports dietetics and functional medicine is perfectly exemplified. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is if you're going for aesthetics only, sure, just a low fat carb like brown rice, a low fat non-starchy veg like broccoli and some lean chicken is going to be great because you're low in fat and you're high in carbs and protein. And aesthetically, that is going to help you shed body fat the quickest and build muscle the fastest. And at the same time, for many women who have the insulin resistant type of PCOS, that is actually something they need to do body composition wise as part of their healing journey. Mm -hmm. That is what I needed to do. I needed to get my body fat percentage down and boost up my skeletal muscle mass so that I could store carbs in the muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, And aesthetically, you look good. However, there's a fine balance in functional medicine for women, especially where it's like, You could look as good as you want to look. You could be as lean and ripped as you want to be, but there is a threshold where it's too much for your body and you need to put the fats back in. And does that mean you'll probably be, you know, a few more pounds on the scale or a pant size up? Sure, that's fine. But your body needs those fats for your hormone production. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's a sweet spot that you can achieve between both of those two, right? Where you said kind of marrying the two worlds and something that I really love. And there's a little bit of research that, but not a ton that's backed this up. And you might be familiar with like refi days they're called. Mm -hmm. So a refi day essentially is what a lot of bodybuilders do when they are in a caloric deficit where they're eating very low fat, uh, where they essentially eat a higher volume of carbohydrate in that day to be able to increase leptin and increase thyroid hormones, drop cortisol levels. And it's a way to be able to get a very transient improvement to hormones to potentially offset some of the negative ramifications that being in that type of uh, hypocaloric state where there's not an F adequate fat in the diet um, can have on your hormone function. So Hmm. that is something that can be interplayed. And I do that with some clients that are good candidates for it. Um, But as you said, I think that there's still a sweet spot that has to be achieved because a lot of people still don't have enough money muscle mass on their body to be able to metabolize that many carbohydrates and it not create an insulin resistant type situation. So unless we're talking like you're been resistance training for years and you've got a really large percentage of muscle mass on your body, you might not be able to follow that type of dietary pattern and see the same results because of that. That's so fascinating. I forgot about the refeed days. Yeah. I used to see bodybuilders, like female bodybuilders on Instagram that were doing bikini competitions mm-hmm. and I would see them do their super low fat, eat a rice cake plain in the morning and some tuna. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, this woman's not getting any fat. And then the next day, yeah, they would have a refeed day. I didn't realize though that the purpose of that refeed day was to reset appetite hormones like leptin. Mm-hmm. Can you go into that a little bit more and talk about what happens to hormones like leptin when we are changing our diet for the purpose of body recomposition, losing fat? gaining muscle. Leptin is an appetite hormone that essentially uh, helps our body know kind of the fuel gauge of um, where our fuel levels are and if our body should be storing fat, if it should be burning fat for, for energy. Leptin is a hormone that um, is very much impacted by being in a caloric deficit or in a hypocaloric state. So essentially, if you are trying to lose weight or you are actively losing weight, that you're likely in a caloric deficit, right? Uh, We know that within just about three to four days that your leptin levels drop by about 30 to 40%. So you see a big 
job happen. And it happens more in women than it does in men. And leptin is going to make your body crave more food, <laughs> essentially is, is what leptin is going to do. And it's going to make it harder for you to be able to see body fat reductions happen as well. So if you have been in a caloric deficit for some time, then it can be helpful to boost those leptin levels by providing carbohydrate in a surplus of what you normally do. The caveat is that it has to be predominantly carbohydrate, that fat doesn't provide that same effect on that leptin. So it is carbohydrate where you really see that most like upregulation of the um, thyroid hormones and leptin hormone. With all of this being said about the importance of carbohydrates, even on the refeed day and how fat doesn't have the same effect on these healthy hormones that essentially tell us we're safe, mm -hmm. right? Leptin is kind of this safety satiety hormone. It tells us we're good. Yeah. We have enough. We're not going to give you these crazy cravings and hunger in the middle of the night. It seems that carbohydrates do a lot in the sense of hormonal safety. And, and so does fat. We need the fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can talk about that as well, the role and importance of fat. But I want to speak to women who go on a low carb diet and it initially works for them. And then they stay on that low carb, high fat diet forever, or even worse keto. Mm -hmm. Why is that perhaps, and, and maybe it's to you, it is that ideal, <laughs> right? And if it's not, why? And can you talk about how carbohydrates improve thyroid health? Yes. Yes. So it always depends, right? Because in some populations, maybe being on a longer term, lower carbohydrate diet might be helpful, such as like postmenopausally, there probably is going to be less harm on your reproductive hormones. Of course, your thyroid hormones are still going to get impacted, but things like estrogen, progesterone, we're not really making those very much when you're postmenopausal. So I'm not as worried about those being impacted. Right. Um, but for women that are in their reproductive years, if you're still menstruating, having a regular menstrual cycle, you're in the age where you should be, maybe you're not because you're on, you know, an oral contraceptive or something like that. Uh, we know that carbohydrates are essential. They have a couple of different purposes. Uh, one is that they help to be able to increase kiss peptin levels and kiss peptin is a neuropeptide that regulates our appetite that also impacts our insulin sensitivity. And there's research that shows that when women are on a lower carbohydrate diet, that kiss peptin levels drop and that that can actually impact your insulin sensitivity and your appetite regulation. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect is that your thyroid hormones, like you mentioned, also drop. Um, Carbohydrates are really important for helping us to be able to convert inactive thyroid hormones, so T4, over to the active form, which is T3. And they also help to be able to lower cortisol levels too, which cortisol ties into this whole conversation around really all hormonal health, but especially thyroid health. Um, and so carbohydrates are going to be really important to be able to really keep everything moving and grooving. And we know from the research that women that are on a ketogenic diet, especially, that it doesn't take very long for them to see a down regulation and those thyroid hormones happen. And it's thought that maybe it's not as problematic if the thyroid hormone levels drop if you're in a ketogenic state because your thyroid hormone sensitivity improves. So that's like the nuance of this, right? So that's where it's always so important to me that we're not just looking at laboratory values, but we're also tracking symptoms with this because it's very easy for us to say, okay, yes, your T3 levels are really low, but if you're not having any issues, like, you know, you're, you're not feeling cold, you're not having bloating, you're not having constipation, a lot of these, you know, typical low thyroid symptoms, then maybe it's not as problematic because maybe that thyroid sensitivity has improved. And like you're saying, maybe it's not as problematic at different stages of the life cycle. Yeah, exactly. For uh, perimenopausal or postmenopausal women, it could be a bit more beneficial. You might get other effects from that ketogenic state or low carb state, perhaps an increased autophagy, mental clarity, all of these things that won't be as detrimental on your hormones because your body is not of reproductive age and thus you're not as sensitive to signals of famine. Yeah. So you just spoke a bit about thyroid hormone conversion. Mm -hmm. And I always like to stress this point in our educational materials. I have, as an herbalist, I have a thyroid formula called ThyroPro. Mm -hmm. And the goal of this formula is to help on a cellular level, help the body convert inactive T4 into active T3. And so what many people don't know is that T4, the hormone that we produce, isn't necessarily what we can use on a cellular level, the body must convert it peripherally. And so I use in that formula herbs like ashwagandha or bacopa or myrrh that have been shown in at least animal trials and clinically with clients to help with that thyroid conversion. Mm -hmm. um, but you are utilizing things like carbohydrate intake and food changes and perhaps micronutrients to support mm -hmm. that conversion. So can you talk a bit about why that conversion is important and how we can support it with methods other than herbs? 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into this and a lot of people, and I think this is one of the shortcomings of just traditional, like standard lab testing, right? Is that I cannot tell you how many cases I see where someone has a totally normal TSH, but they have a low free T3, which means that if they just got their TSH levels tested, then their doctor would send them on the way and say there's no issue going on. But when you actually look at a deeper level, we can see that there's actually some cellular slowing down essentially that's happening, right? And what really is happening in that situation is our mitochondria are really what is responsible for this whole situation. And when there is hypothyroidism, the mitochondria are slowing down. So cellular processes are essentially halting. And so we have to look in a couple of different ways to be able to support this is one, are those mitochondria getting a enough nutrients to be able to support this process. And our mitochondria are impacted by a lot of different things. We know that exercise impacts mitochondria both positively and in a harmful way, depending on what you're doing and how much. Um, but we know that there's nutrients like B vitamins and CoQ10, D ribose, alpha lipoic acid that are all extremely important for this. Um, we also know that there's things in our diet and food that can impact our mitochondria, such as foods that are high in heavy metals. And this is where going back to like the body builder diet, eating a lot of tuna and brown rice could be an issue because those are really high me heavy metal foods, right? So we might want to look at as like removing some of these high heavy metal foods uh, that could be impacting mitochondrial function. So that's one element of it. The second element that I always like to address is what's going on with liver because the liver is 70% responsible for that thyroid hormone conversion, right? Yes. That's why we have milk thistle in the formula yeah. as well. Yes. You need that liver support. You have to have that liver support. And I think a lot of people think when you see say that they're like, there's something wrong with my liver. Like I don't have like anything wrong with my liver. Right. And it's like, well, your liver, there's, we have genes that are in our liver that help to be able to really bring our toxins and hormones through each phase of our liver. And we probably need support in those different phases. Just the society that we live in, we're exposed to toxins all the time. Our liver has a lot of work to do. And so if we're seeing that low free T3, then we probably need things like milk thistle, like you mentioned, or glutathione or the foods that help us make glutathione foods that are rich in sulfur like uh, onions and garlic and cruciferous vegetables and such. So we want to make sure that the liver has all the nutrients that it needs to be able to do this process as well. And then I think the last piece of this is asking the bigger question as to like, why is the body slowing down? Why is the body under stress? And I saw this a lot when I was working with high level athletes was there was so many situations of a really low free T3 level. And Part of it was the mitochondrial piece. Part of it was that they weren't consuming enough carbohydrate to be able to meet their, meet their needs that their body had for hormonal function. And so, as you mentioned, we have to make sure that we have those adequate car carbohydrates in place in a way to also support our insulin levels, right? That's going to help us to be able to convert those inactive thyroid hormones over to the active form. When you just asked, why is the body slowing down? I think there's so much wisdom in that question beyond just the carbohydrate piece. I think there's wisdom in that question that relates to our HPA access, which is another reason why functional medicine rocks because we're looking at the impact that mental stress of, oh my God, life is going too fast is having all the way from the brain level, the hypothalamus to the adrenals, to the thyroid, that that stress can actually slow our thyroid down. The body is almost rebelling by slowing things down. I can't tell you how important the nervous system is to low thyroid function. I mean, it, it has to be, it has to be supported. It has to be addressed because it's always involved. I mean, really all hormones, the nervous system is going to play a role in, but definitely if that TSH, I always think of it as like if your TSH is high and you've got low free T3 levels. It's like you have people that are outside of the door of your house. Like they're trying to get into the party and you're not answering. So they keep knocking harder and harder. That's essentially happening. What's happening with hypothyroidism, right? Is it's like these people can't get into the party. These thyroid hormones can't get into the cells. And so the TSH, the brain keeps knocking harder and harder to get the cells to respond and get those thyroid hormones in. And maybe the message of you have to slow down, you have to take some time to meditate is also knocking at us yeah. harder and harder. Yeah. And it's almost being reflected hormonally, Totally. which is, I love those mirrors of the body. Um, and I think that you're giving people really valuable insight here that they can directly 
speak with their practitioner about when they're looking at their labs together. And you're painting this picture of someone with high TSH, low free T3. However, we know that often free T3 is not tested in a standard thyroid panel. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to go back, I have an episode called Ask the Herbalist, everything you need to know about hypothyroidism. I go over all of these labs in that episode, but I would love to hear them from you. And I'd love for you to also talk a bit about reverse T3 as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important one. So normally when you get labs tested, they're just going to test TSH. And the main reason for that is actually it wasn't up until I believe it was the 1970s when thyroid hormones were actually tested because there's a lot of, um, I guess, discrepancy around, um, you know, does our thyroid hormones always going to be affected whenever someone's in a hypothyroid state? So the reason why TSH is the main one that's tested, uh, because TSH is a pituitary hormone. It's not actually a thyroid hormone. So it's just telling us how the brain is essentially knocking or communicating with the thyroid to then make hormones. And that's because TSH is the hormone that is mainly affected. If someone is on thyroid hormone replacement, if someone is on levothyroxine, which is a common thyroid hormone replacement medication, their TSH levels are going to be affected. And so that's one of the hormones that is mainly tracked because of the role that that medication has on TSH levels. Um, we actually don't see that something like levothyroxine is going to have um, a hundred percent effect on T4 and T3 levels. And so, you know, TSH is really just that pituitary hormone, but it's an important, I guess, screening tool for if there's issues going on in the thyroid, but then really to paint the whole picture of what's going on in the thyroid, we need to test things like your total T4, your free T4, your total T3, your free T3, and your reverse T3. So T4, the free T4, is essentially the unbound amount of T4 that your body has, but it's inactive. So mm -hmm. it's not actually having like the cellular effect that we want those thyroid hormones to have. What really matters is how much of that T4 is getting converted over to free T3. And there's always going to be a little bit of T4 that gets converted to reverse T3. It can really take like two different directions. It can go down to reverse T3. It can go down to free T3. You're always going to have some of it going down reverse T3. But what we want to prevent is having a lot of it going down to reverse T3. Because when we've got too much of that T4 going down to reverse T3, we don't get any of the good stuff from those thyroid hormones. Those thyroid hormones are getting deactivated. What is reverse T3? Reverse T3 is just a type of hormone that essentially is like the deactivated form of our free T3. Um, it is not always tested because in someone that is like chronically ill, it actually isn't a great tool for being able to assess what's going on within the thyroid. But generally what we want is for your reverse T3 levels to be somewhere below 15, ideally closer to like that 10 range. Mm -hmm. And if we're seeing that someone's reverse T3 levels are above 15, then that's really a sign that the body's deactivating a lot of that thyroid hormone that should be going over to the free T3, that, that active form. So what are the things that prevent or that cause a high level of reverse T3? Cellular stress. Yeah. So, so high cortisol, essentially cellular stress, physical, emotional stress, kind of. All of it, yeah. So uh, high cortisol definitely impacts this. We know inflammation impacts this process. Uh, nutrient deficiencies, we need minerals to be able to convert T4 to T3. If you've mm -hmm. got deficiency of selenium, of magnesium, um, these are absolutely going to affect your T4 to T3 conversion. We know that inositol, um, which is a sugar-like substance that's also really helpful for PCOS, is also very helpful for converting T4 over to T3. So there's a lot of minerals that are responsible here. So a lot of time nutrient deficiency go into it. Um, the liver as well. Um, so mitochondrial function, right? If the body's like under stress, then that's going to really impact the way that our mitochondria are functioning. So there's a lot of factors that are driving it. And so that's where it's looking at all these angles to see, okay, do you potentially check any of these boxes that could be causing more of that T4 to go to reverse T3 than T3? And that's where functional medicine comes in and working with a practitioner, because if you have high reverse T3, you can guess all day. Oh, it's probably because I'm stressed out. My cortisol is mm -hmm. high. Oh, it's probably because I'm deficient in magnesium. So I need to go take magnesium. You, you will go down such a rabbit hole there that doesn't lead you often to very real tangible results. Mm -hmm. And so when you're working with a functional practitioner, I'm guessing you're even going to look at things like gut infections, perhaps yeah. because a gut infection, an overgrowth of SIBO or something like that 
can cause the type of inflammation that you just referred to that can cause high reverse T3. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If we see someone has that high reverse T3, low free T3, then I'm going to look at everything from like, you know, sometimes we can just assess micronutrients through just doing a diet recall, but sometimes it is helpful to also have lab testing of what's in the red blood cells. Um, but definitely looking at the gut to see what's going on. Do we have enough beneficial microbes? Is there overgrowth? We know that our, our beneficial microbes in our gut also help convert T4 to T3. It's about 15% of that conversion happens through those microbes too. So the gut is a huge point of contention when it comes to the low thyroid hormones. I'm going to do a whole other episode on this with my friend Michelle Shapiro about histamine, but yeah. I just have to ask for someone who needs more good bacteria in their gut, but has a histamine issue and tolerance and can't always eat the probiotic fermented mm -hmm. foods. What does that person do? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that making sure you have the prebiotics in your diet, the fibers to be able to help feed the bacteria that are already there is probably mm -hmm. the place to start. Um, with any type of histamine response though, there's generally some type of issue with like not enough DAO enzyme to be able to help break down that histamine, leaky gut, things of that sort. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of support that can be done at the same time, but yeah, if someone has a histamine intolerance, it's generally not advisable it's definitely not for them to be consuming anything that's fermented while they are trying to work on the histamine overload. But that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that's forever. You know, it's maybe just while we're trying to correct the histamine issue. Exactly. Um, and you just said perhaps looking at micronutrients in the red blood cells. What on earth does that mean? What kind of magical test is this? <laughs> yeah, you can get your blood test, just like a regular blood test. It's not, you're probably not going to get this done at your general doctor, be through a functional provider. Um, we use like, um, different independent phlebotomists to do it, but they'll, yeah, separate your red blood cells and to be able to test for things like omega-3 fatty acid levels, omega-6 fatty acid levels, um, your magnesium, your iron. Oh, you're talking about levels. like an RBC magnesium yeah, test. Exactly. Okay. I've seen yeah. that on my labs mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you have to request it specifically from your doctor or work with someone who does it just like you have to request this full panel of thyroid labs. It's not yeah. standard. They're yeah. just looking at T TSH. And a lot of traditional labs, like, you know, we use Quest and LabCorp for some testing, but they won't even do a lot of these RBC tests. And so we, that's where we use like an independent lab um, to be able to get some of that more comprehensive information. I ask because you keep talking about minerals and I love that. And I follow so many functional dietitians in the space who go even deeper and do the hair mineral analysis test yeah. and all of that. And I've never tested my minerals, but it's something that I just hear enough of in the space that I'm like, is that worth doing? So what do you mean when you say minerals? Is it just the big ones that you mentioned, like selenium, magnesium, zinc, or is it, um, the micronutrients as well, like the trace mm -hmm. minerals and how does one test for it? Are the hair mineral tests valid? The hair mineral tests can be a good option. I use them from time to time with some patients. I'm not, I, they're, I'm not married to them, if that makes sense. Uh, like some individuals are, but yes, these minerals are essential. You know, just starting with the thyroid, you have to think about how are thyroid hormones made? They're made from the mineral iodine. And we know that hypothyroidism can both be caused from low iodine as well as high iodine levels. So if we're just guessing on your iodine levels and maybe supplementing with iodine, it could be problematic or it might not be enough to be able to create the adequate environment for thyroid function, right? So we know that. We know that iron increases TSH. So we know that someone that has an iron deficiency also at more risk of hypothyroidism. And then we also know that there's minerals like magnesium and selenium and chromium that are all essential to helping us convert these hormones over from that T4 over to that T3. But minerals aren't just reserved for the thyroid. We also use minerals for all reproductive function, really all hormonal function in the body. And unfortunately, when our body's under stress, which a lot lot of individuals are, uh, we lose minerals at a faster rate. And so we just, you have a higher, what's called like magnesium burn rate, right? So you're going to need more minerals to essentially offset how much your body's burning through because these minerals are being used to be able to convert the food that we eat into energy. It's such an interesting thing to think about the magnesium burn rate, even B vitamins, because mm -hmm. you think about your neurotransmitters yeah. and when you're in a hyper excitatory state, when you're doing a lot of work, when you're under a lot of emotional stress, you're making and using and burning through more of your neurotransmitters. And what are the building blocks that help you make those neurotransmitters? B vitamins. Mm -hmm. So it's these minerals aren't just things that hang around in the blood they make things in our bodies. They're precursors to things. And we use them when life gets hard. So yeah. we need more of them. Yeah. And that's where I think that you really can't do it with just food. You can do a really good job of it, but I do think that we need some help through supplementation, especially if your body's under a stress state, because 
our, we know that our soil is extremely depleted in minerals now, and we're just not getting that magnesium and those B vitamins like we once did. And so many people, I mean, I can't tell you how many omega-3 tests I run, which omega-3 is not a mineral, it's a fatty acid. But um, just to kind of show the point is like, I can't tell you how many times we run those and people are eating salmon and sardines often in their diet and they're still deficient. And omega-3s really function more of like a hormone in the body than they do a nutrient like vitamin D. And so that's a really important piece to talking about hormones. If someone wants to up their minerals, if they know that, okay, I don't eat a diverse diet or I know I'm not eating enough fruits and veggies and I know that I can at least start with increasing my minerals to help my hormones and my sports performance. Mm -hmm. If they were to go at it without supplementing at first, what's kind of like Lauren's plan for upping your minerals Mm -hmm. diet wise? I think plants, of course, are going to be really important. Um, Seeds, legumes, leafy greens, all are going to be great options. I really love smoothies. And it's probably like the former sports dietitian in me is like, that's how I would pack all of my athletes with everything that they needed. Like most of my male athletes, they were not going to be eating the salmon and broccoli that I ordered them. So I would make them a packed smoothie and I'd throw all those minerals in there and literally just load it up with the calories, the macronutrients, the micronutrients that they needed. Right. So that can be a great way to get these minerals in. I'm also a big fan of beef liver. And I think that that's a really dense source and kind of like nature's multivitamin as a way to be able to get in a lot of these minerals that just aren't super easily accessible to us. Is there something that's happening with the vitamin A in the beef liver and how it's interacting with iron as well? Yeah. Vitamin A does help to be able to, uh, really like help our body recycle iron better. Um, but the really difference with beef liver versus doing like beta carotene, which is a form of vitamin A can convert over to vitamin A is that with beef liver, you're getting the active form of vitamin A retinol which is a lot of people have difficulty converting beta carotene to vitamin A. So you're just getting a lot more bang for your buck. And vitamin A is so critical. We know vitamin A low levels cause testosterone levels to drop. It's extremely important for hormones. It's also really important for your skin. That's why it's in a lot of skincare products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of women have acne as a hormonal symptom. So Mm -hmm. it's critical for a lot of those reasons. The tough part is it's hard to get retinol without eating beef liver. Yeah. I mean, egg yolks only have so much. Yeah. <laughs> so I I have a recipe on the blog. Um, my husband made these beef liver meatballs. Mm-hmm. He ground up some liver in with ground beef, but yeah. it's like a high ratio. And then he also put rice in the mix oh, okay. to make it more palatable. Mm-hmm. And they're amazing. And I just need to force myself to eat them or remind myself to eat them. Or I, it's not even I have to force it. They're good. Yeah. Some ketchup. They're delicious. <laughs> but um it's just doing it. That's such a huge health hack for the thyroid is just eating more beef liver to get the vitamin A. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Also earlier, I just want to touch on this two things. The other caveat of the bodybuilder diet, that's the broccoli, brown rice and salmon or whatever chicken over Mm -hmm. and over again that we don't think of, but now know of in the functional med world is gut diversity. Yeah. So the microbiome is not even at play in the old bodybuilding world. Can you just speak a little bit about the issue with that and the importance of the diversity of our microbiome when it comes to our hormones and our thyroid health? Yeah. I mean, your microbiome, we're still learning more and more about it, but we know that we have, you know, trillions of bacteria in our gut that are helping us be able to not only break down and metabolize the food that we eat, but also even help with things like blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity and helping support our immune function and such. And we really support these probiotics, these natural bacteria in our gut through the fibers that we eat in our diet and through having a diversity. And so we know from the Human Genome Project that we need about 30 plant varieties per week. And that can include not just vegetables, but also fruits and root vegetables and herbs and spices and things um, can go into that. But we need a wide diversity. So if you're just eating brown rice (laughs) and you're just eating broccoli, we're not, I mean, we're getting the cruciferous, which is great for estrogen, but um, you're probably going to have low levels of beneficial probiotics or beneficial bacteria in the gut. And that can be really problematic for a lot of other health reasons. And a lot of times we see, you know, even just the everyday, like I have so many food sensitivity issues where people are just like, I get bloated whenever I eat beans or whenever I eat lettuce or anything. And it's just because they don't have enough of these beneficial bacteria Mm -hmm. to help be able to break down these fibers when they eat them. I got you guys. If you have problems breaking down beans specifically (laughs) and want to eat more fiber, my formula bloat BFF, I have a soil based strain in there, um, to help boost the diversity of the rest of your bugs, but not actually add extra bacteria in there. Mm -hmm. So it's really good for folks with SIBO. And it's also made with specific enzymes that help you to break down beans and fibrous veggies. My goal with that was to have people eat more vegetables, um, not just use it when they're having pizza and don't want to look bloated. It's actually to eat more veggies. 
the other thing that you said earlier is that when you're looking at someone who has low minerals, you're perhaps trying to remove some of the heavy metal rich foods in their diet. Mm -hmm. Can you say why and talk a little bit about heavy metals displacing some of our minerals? these heavy metals not only can displace our minerals and can create more issues with these mineral deficiencies that we're talking about, but our thyroid also has an affinity for heavy metals. And we know that heavy metals heavily impact our thyroid hormone production. They also heavily impact our mitochondrial function. Mitochondria are really so critical to fer fertility, to reproduction, to thyroid hormone function, to really every hormonal process in the body, because our mitochondria is where our master hormone pregnenolone is made. And so so if we're having these heavy metals that are impacting that mitochondrial function, you're going to see downstream impacts to hormonal function. You mentioned before some nutrients that are potent for our mitochondria, things mm -hmm. like CoQ10. Are there any foods that are rich in those specific nutrients that you mentioned? Maybe you could give us a refresher that we should be including more of in our diet. It is hard to it find, is hard some, to find of some of these nutrients in like food, D things like D-ribose and CoQ10. They're just not readily available. You get a little bit here or there, but it's not quite enough to really be able to support mitochondrial dysfunction, which a lot of people are dealing with. Um, I really would recommend when you were talking about mitochondria, focusing mainly on antioxidants in your diet. So antioxidants come in many shapes and forms, right? You've got things like vitamin C, polyphenols, vitamin E. These are food things that are vitamins that are found in things like your citrus fruits, your leafy greens, your dark berries, your green tea, uh, your olive oil, your almonds that are providing us these antioxidants to be able to help support that mitochondrial function. Our mitochondria doesn't need just food and antioxidants as nutrients. It actually needs light. Plants are really like where everything started when we think about life and plants take light and water and they convert that into energy. And mm -hmm. as humans, we partially do the same. And so, you know, red light, for example, is becoming extremely important and red light therapy can be really supportive for your mitochondrial function. Um, but even just natural sunlight is incredibly important. You know, not only do we get things like vitamin D that are important for our mitochondria, but it also helps to be able to signal to our pineal gland behind our eye um, that regulates our circadian rhythm. And our circadian rhythm is really important mm -hmm. when we're talking about mitochondrial function. So natural light exposure in the morning time, especially, and then potentially therapeutically using red light therapy as a way to be able to support mitochondrial function can be two really great light therapy options. Yeah. Period. Nothing's going to replace that natural sunlight and yeah. seeing the light in the morning, just opening up a window, getting outside first thing to, to bathe your eyes in that light. But I would say out of all the potentially gimmicky wellness devices and high cost things, red light is the only thing that I've ever felt like is really worth it. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to the red light device that I use. It's incredible by Loombox. Um, it was actually developed by a doctor who's been on our show as well. And I see a lot of folks using red light for their thyroid directly over their thyroid. And is this because the thyroid is so heavily influenced by mitochondrial health? Yeah. Yeah, red light can be extremely healing and anti-inflammatory to the thyroid. Um, I also love utilizing things topically too, like glutathione superoxide dismutase. These are other things that you can apply onto the thyroid that really help to provide just this anti-inflammatory and um, really combat some of the free radicals that are causing that thyroid hormone destruction. And when we're talking about supporting, uh, supporting detoxification, we really want to start at phase three and work backwards, right? So phase three being we've got to make sure that the gut is open, that we are pooping regularly, 100%. that that's happening, and then go up to phase two, make sure that we have the amino acids and antioxidants, and then up to phase one. If someone listening is like, oh, that's where my problem is, you got <laughs> it, I'm constipated, what are some easily implementable strategies that they can do to just open up that pathway? I mean, the basics would be starting with fiber and water, but I'm sure a lot of your listeners are already doing that, right? A lot of people are, and sometimes fiber can actually even be more problematic, right? So there's yeah. like that sweet spot. Um, one of my favorite things for constipation is olive vera. It has so many other benefits too. It's great. It's high in potassium. So it's great for the adrenals as well. Um, it also has um, anti-inflammatory properties. There's actually been research that it can help with lowering thyroid antibodies in like the case of Hashimoto's, right? So there's a lot of multi-purposes for it, but it's kind of as like nature's natural laxative, honestly. 
actually. And I find that just a combo of aloe vera with maybe a little bit of like magnesium and making sure that you have enough electrolytes in your diet as well, because sometimes electrolyte deficiencies can also um, impact the amount of like peristalsis, essentially like our body's contraction of these, um, of like moving food through our digestive system, right? Um, that can be really helpful for getting things moving in the digestive system. Soluble fibers are so magic for so many reasons and psyllium husk is one of those. Some individuals I found, and this has been really discovered through like individuals that have gone colonics where they're like, oh, like, you know, you're getting your bowels essentially eliminated and cleaned out is that there can create a little bit of this caking with psyllium husk because it is such a, like if you've ever mixed psyllium husk with water before, it creates this huge caking effect, right? So I find that for some people, sun fiber is a little bit more gentle and it works very similar to psyllium husk, but it just creates a little bit less of that caking. And some people that have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, sometimes have problems with psyllium husk. And so sun fiber can be a little bit more gentle. I love that. Okay. We'll link sun fiber. Um, I mean, some people also have interviewed people before that have mentioned Metamucil, but that's mm-hmm. just a psyllium husk as well, right? Yeah. The okay. active ingredient is psyllium husk and then there's just there's crap in yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Love that. So what is the PCOS low thyroid connection? Cause so many people have this quote comorbidity. However, comorbidity means a underlying biological mm-hmm. issue. Yeah. Yeah. So PCOS is a metabolic and endocrine condition. And whenever you have one endocrine condition, it's just like autoimmunity. There's likely going to be more that happen because all of our endocrine system, our our hormones, really that's what endocrine means, right? Are all interconnected. They all really balance one another and impact one another. And so with a lot of the hormone imbalances or um, out of range hormones that we see with PCOS, it can also drive thyroid abnormalities and vice versa. So for example, we know that with PCOS, there generally is high luteinizing hormone levels and there is high testosterone levels, right? And because of that hormonal profile, there's also low progesterone levels. And progesterone is extremely pro-thyroid. And so that hormone imbalance in itself can impact our thyroid hormone levels. But thyroid hormones also help us make progesterone. So it's this back and forth relationship, right? So then if you look at the flip side, someone that has hypothyroidism that maybe doesn't have enough thyroid hormones, they could also have low progesterone levels and there could be a hormone imbalance on that other end, right? So all of it is interconnected. And I mentioned earlier that both conditions we see are correlated with oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. We know that those can be two drivers of both of them. So we have to, with both of those situations, go back to why are the cells slowing down? Why is the body down regulating? What are the, why are the cells under stress? What do they need to be able to really get the nutrients to be able to make the adequate amounts of these hormones? So this is why PCOS and thyroid conditions are so often diagnosed together. Yeah. Wild. You know, I'm always going to bring it back to a little bit of the woo, a little bit of the emotional, spiritual side and some of the traditional herbalism and Chinese medicine side. So I just want to add, because you mentioned this high testosterone level and low progesterone. You didn't necessarily mention estrogen because I'm sure person to person, a lot of the times folks are actually having some high estrogen in relation to progesterone or overtly high estrogen with PCOS as mm-hmm. well. And that could be from a myriad of factors. Obviously, we're, we just talked about constipation. That's a big one. When you're constipated, your body recirculates estrogen over and over again, and it can be high there from the gut. But my teachers would always talk about, and specifically Richard Mandelbaum, who I have an episode with him on Lyme disease. We'll also link that below. He would say that PCOS involves all of these hormones that are very young, with the highest young hormone being testosterone, that being totally off kilter in women. And then estrogen also being a pretty young hormone. We think of it as a female hormone, but it's not yin. It's actually young because it's expanding. It encourages growth, right? When we have growths of cysts or fibroids, that's estrogen driven. So it's actually young. And then the most yin hormone, the softening true feminine hormone is progesterone. And that's the one that is lowest in PCOS. And when we think about behaviors and actions and cultures that are too young, American culture of the go, go, go. I constantly have to be productive. I constantly have to be performing in the quote masculine or young side of life where I'm focused on productivity and output, not going inward and resting Mm. and inward and rest is yin. And so it's just once again with the thyroid underlying emotion being, I never have enough time with PCOS. It's also this overly driven young, I'm stuck in the rat race and I'm dying over here kind of phenomenon. That's also driving these hormones to go 
too high and causing that low progesterone. Yeah, I mean, testosterone really is more of a stress hormone. Like our androgens are more of a stress hormone than anything else. You know, I think a lot of women don't realize that you make more testosterone than you do any other sex hormone. Does that go for women and men? The statement that testosterone is more of a stress hormone? Yeah, testosterone is more of a stress hormone. Yeah. And you androgens come from your adrenals and also your ovaries, but you make quite a bit of testosterone from your ovaries as well. And that's why a lot of women postmenopausally, they deal with a lot of weight gain in their abdominal section, dark horse facial hair growth, because they've got got high amounts of testosterone and low amounts of sex hormone binding globulin, which is like exactly what's going on with PCOS. Well, also, I mean, there's plenty of studies on men with higher levels of testosterone and how they're more likely to engage in, you know, combat Mm -hmm. and more physical sports and all these different things. So it makes sense that even a woman would be mounting a high testosterone level in response to feeling like they always need to fight through life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because when they've looked at like hunter gatherers and just evolutionarily for hormones, they had a lot lower testosterone levels than we do today. So you think about is, well, their stress was different than ours. Their stress was very acute. Right. Where, like you said, like going and fighting on the front line, going and getting food. Right. These very like high stress states. But it was very acute. Whereas we today have much more chronic stress. And we also have much higher levels of testosterone than we did, you know, when we were hunter gatherers. Wow. But obviously we need a certain amount of testosterone. Of course. For a healthy life. Yes. For healthy drive and sex drive and all Mm -hmm. the things. Okay. Would you say that regardless in all of the types of PCOS, there's an adrenal component? Yeah. Okay. Can we talk about the over-exercising factor? So uh, exercise is a stressor on the body and it's a really good stressor. And that's the stressor of exercise is how we adapt and how we build better muscles and how we increase our aerobic capacity and performance. But it also comes with a cortisol response. And we see the greatest cortisol response with resistance training. And with cortisol, that's one of your adrenal hormones. And so if we aren't fueling our body sufficiently or properly to be able to bring down that cortisol response, response after exercise, or we are fueling too much of that cortisol response through exercise and then also fueling too much of it in our day-to-day life, you're going to see some issues happen with your ability to manage those androgens coming from the adrenal glands. So it really is this push and a pull. And you know, with our, we have a workout program that we offer because my husband is an athletic performance coach and he actually like helped me wrap my head around this because I was doing way too much too, whenever him and I first met and he taught me about concurrent training. Are you familiar with concurrent training? No. So concurrent training is used a lot in athletes because he very much believes, like you said at the beginning, women should train like athletes. And that's really how you like improve hormonal function. Right. So concurrent training is essentially what athletes do, where they do aerobic exercise and resistance training typically on the same day. And but the research has shown that you don't want to do them back to back, that they need to be separated by at least six hours because they're competing mechanisms. Right. Like if you think about the aerobic, how to build your aerobic system, it's totally different energy system that you're using, you're, you're using mainly aerobic phosphorylation. Whereas when we're talking about resistance training, you're using mostly a glycolytic pathway. And so there are different type of systems that our body's using to be able to convert energy to fuel that type of exercise. So we want to try to prevent doing them back to back and at least have them spread out by six hours. But like what we've done with our workout program is we just separate them onto completely opposite days. Yes. Yeah. So much easier. So much easier because it's like, (laughs) who wants to work out twice per day unless you're like a professional athlete? Uh, Or unless you're doing 75 hard and hating your life. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, And it's not necessary, you know? So like what we do is it's like, okay, you're going to resistance train. It's going to be full body resistance training because that's that's where we know from the research you get the greatest growth hormone and testosterone response and also the greatest insulin sensitivity. And then the next day you're doing all aerobic training. That's not going to be in a high cortisol situation. It's really helping your body to be able to improve mitochondrial biogenesis so that your body becomes more metabolically flexible. It's helping lower cortisol because it's not in a carbohydrate demanding state. It's in a very low intensity state. And then it's providing enough recovery before you do that next resistance training workout. So I think it really just comes back to is knowing how to structure an effective week of workouts that's going to really provide the right stressor because you want that stressor, like you said, from resistance training, but not too much of a stressor to where it's driving that androgen production from the adrenals. Before I ask you to tell us our ideal workout (laughs) split and what you guys talk about in your program, and we'll definitely include a link to that, is um, 
You mentioned you want to lower cortisol after resistance training sessions properly. Yeah. Is that done through carbohydrates? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How else can we lower cortisol after a resistance Sodium. training? Sodium. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So both of those, which generally you think about like, I mean, not that it's a great example, but Gatorade, right? Yeah. It's basically carbohydrate and An sodium. An electrolyte stick. Elec yeah, we love exactly. It. What about people who are like, well, I'm trying to do the sodium and the electrolytes, but I'm getting puffy. Are they not utilizing the water properly? Yeah, they probably aren't getting enough potassium to counterbalance that in the other parts of the day. You still do want potassium with that. And when I said Gatorade as an example, I don't recommend Gatorade by any means. I was just using that as an example yeah. of like what was traditionally done. Um, but to, yeah, if you, you shouldn't, if, as long as you're consuming enough potassium in the later part of the day, and then of course you're working on like blood flow and lymphatic system, then you shouldn't be having any of that puffiness happen. But if you don't get enough potassium in, which a lot of people don't because- we don't potassium is hard to get. Can you tell us about that? Because it's something that every time I remember it and, and like realize how little potassium I'm eating, it yeah. blows my freaking mind. What are our potassium requirements and what are most of us getting? And how yeah. hard is it to meet that RDA? Yeah. I mean, you need more than 3000 milligrams of potassium per day. And in an avocado, I believe it's like 400 milligrams. And an avocado is one of the highest sources of potassium. More than a banana. than a banana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And isn't potato kind of high? Yeah. Potatoes higher than a banana too. Huh. Yeah. Um, but olive vera is a great source. Potassium has a couple hundred milligrams in there. So, but as you can imagine, if you're only getting in one potassium source a day and that only has like 400 milligrams, you're not even coming close to 3000 milligrams per day. Damn, this is so much to think about. Okay. Potassium every day, 30 plants a week, <laughs> my minerals, my freaking carbs and protein. Oh my gosh. It, it can feel overwhelming sometimes, which is also why it's so nice to work with someone one-on-one -on -one who can make a plan for you Yeah, and can make sure that you're being nutritionally balanced. It's, we can't do it alone. Practitioners are everything. So in terms of the potassium, what's going to happen to us when we're not getting enough of it. Can you talk about the potassium and thyroid hormone connection? Yeah. So, I mean, potassium is incredibly, it's a mineral. So it's incredibly important for your thyroid hormone production. It's incredibly important for even making stomach acid in your guts to be able to degrade the minerals that we eat in our food for something that like our cells can actually use for energy. Um, but potassium really works in tandem with sodium. So they kind of have this like back and forth relationship. And for example, like sodium increases blood pressure in the acute state, you see an increase in blood pressure potassium helps to be able to counterbalance that and lower that hypertensive or that like a blood pressure elevating effect, right? So when we think about the thyroid, well, we don't want to be in this chronically like hypertensive, high cortisol type state, potassium is really driving it down to be able to help balance it out so that we can get that nervous system more into that parasympathetic state, which is going to help to be able to improve your TSH levels and ultimately improve your thyroid hormone production. Potassium is incredibly important for, I mean, just helping with muscle contraction, right? You've probably, people have heard of before, you know, getting muscle cramps because you have not adequate amounts of potassium. There is some, uh, I guess, like misnomer to that and that magnesium is also really important. I think that people forget the role of magnesium and muscle contraction too. And there's also like a nervous system involvement when it comes to muscle cramps as well, that goes way beyond minerals, but potassium is going to be a really important way to be able to support that nervous system balance. It's ultimately going to go into cortisol and your thyroid hormones. Back to the workout program and the ideal exercise split. And can you include our Pilates girls in this too? What does that perfect week look like? Yeah. So really the perfect week has about three full body resistance training workouts. And that was one thing that my husband, again, really reframed my mind around because I was coming from kind of that bodybuilder type mentality of upper body, lower body split, or maybe even sometimes wanting to do more lower body than upper body, right? Which I think Same. a lot of people are prone to. And he was like, no, if you really want to get this hormonal response, they need to be like full body lifts. And then also it consolidates stressors. So it's like, okay, we're going to put all resources towards this workout. It's going to be high stress. Make sure you're proper properly fueled going in, coming out of it, allow your body at least 24 hours recovery. Cause that's how long it takes for your body to really recover from that type of high stress workout. And then the next day you're going to do something, you're going to rest, or you're going to do something that's purely aerobic in nature. And we really stick with zone two exercise. We're not getting into that glycolytic state with those types of like anything endurance. It's all zone two. If you are doing Pilates, my husband always argues with me on this. Cause I do agree. But I only go like once a week and he's like, that's not equivalent 
equivalent to full body resistance training. Like you're not, not getting the hormonal effect. Yeah, which like it's not. But right? it has a place. But it has a place. It's it really changes your body. It yeah. does lengthen your muscles. There's something happening there. Yeah, there is. Yeah. And it's great for your core. I think that it has like I don't get the same core effect from just, you know, bracing during resistance training. No, like my that, core gets square. Mm-hmm. That targeted like Legree on the core, I think is so powerful. So I usually will do it on I'll do it in place of a zone two day. Um, or I'll do it in addition to that. So maybe I'll do like a 20 minute, 30 minute walk and then I'll do like a 40 minute Legree workout. That was my next question. What constitutes a zone two workout that doesn't get into the glycolytic store? So yeah. obviously you don't mean like long distance running. You mean walking is jogging. Yeah, it, it can be depending on how fit you are. For some people, like even just a really slow jog might push them into zone three or zone four. But if you're pretty aerobically fit, then you can probably stay in zone two with a light jog or maybe even like a jog walk kind of repeat situation. I usually do an incline walk, but it's like pretty heavy incline and a fast walk on okay. the treadmill. It's just my favorite because I can like listen to podcasts or read a book. Um, but it could also be like a bike. It could be a hike. Would someone be overdoing it if they're getting that zone two every day because they're walking their dog every day for an hour, even on the days that they're resistance training? Well, I think that it's never going to hurt because it, there's it's such a low stress activity that you're not creating cortisol response and it's just helping with recovery, honestly, because it's just mobilization, right? So I don't think it ever hurts to be doing it in addition, but if it is you're walking your dog and it's like real zone two, you know, you're kind of, you know, pushing it with your pups, yeah. then you might want to look at separating it from your resistance training so that you're not getting into that competing mechanism type situation like we're talking about. The other thing I want to ask is that now that we understand that we want to separate the way that we're eating from the quick carbs and protein, low fat in the morning to the higher fat more diverse fibers and plants and antioxidants in the evening if you're working out in the morning. Um, can you walk us through an ideal week of example meals if someone's following that split that you just mentioned? Yeah. So it will depend on what time of day you're exercising, of course. But I think we initially talked about like morning workout. I do that as well. So I think both of us that applies to. So prior to your workout, and it could be even up to 30 minutes prior, you don't need to have a ton of time in between here. But yeah, I agree. That's another thing I eat. I eat right before my mm -hmm. workout, an hour to a half hour. Mm -hmm. And people are like, how do you work out on a full stomach? I don't understand you're crazy for eating, but it's good. It's great as long as you're eating the right thing. So they might be like, eating the oatmeal, but they're adding a bunch of almond butter to it or something. And that's why they're like, I could never do that because they've got all that fat in there slowing that digestion. And then when they go to exercise, it doesn't feel good at all, right? Because their stomach feels so heavy. So I think as long as you're eating the right thing, then it's absolutely fine for you to eat 30 minutes to 60 minutes prior. And really that's what you want because if you eat too far away from that workout, then you probably have burned through everything and you don't have that readily available energy source there. So something that contains carbohydrate and protein, oatmeal could be great. Add some protein powder into it. That's but don't great. Add fat. But no fat. Yeah. Um, so you could add like some fruit and oatmeal and then protein powder. That can be a great pre-workout option um, for some people that maybe can't tolerate grains or don't eat oats. Like, when I was cheering in college, I used to do sweet potatoes always. That was kind of my, yes. my go-to source. Right? A sweet, a Japanese sweet potato yeah. for breakfast is the most nourishing, hormone-friendly breakfast. And then you just pair it with a protein. Yeah. yeah. I'll do a sweet potato and a protein shake, like with just water so mm -hmm. that there's no fat. Yeah. yeah. Or if you like doing a little bit of caffeine, because I mean, caffeine does help with performance. It is an ergogenic aid. And if you if it doesn't impact your adrenal function and things or you, your body is OK with it, uh, then you could always do like a, you know, dolled up coffee concoction that maybe has some collagen in it and some maple syrup or honey, something like that to provide the protein and the carbohydrate. There is some added benefit to doing some collagen before exercise as well, because we know that collagen prior to exercise, especially when it's with vitamin vitamin C, that it does help to be able to really increase the blood amount of collagen that helps us with soft tissue rebuilding. So if someone's having issues like joint and ligament pain or health or had surgery on any joints or ligaments, then that can be a really great option to do prior to exercise as long as the exercise is utilizing that area. So say that they're like rehabbing a knee injury, then as long as you're doing some squatting or, you know, anything lower body in that workout, then the collagen prior can actually be like an added benefit beforehand. We just gave the example of oatmeal that's made with some protein powder or maybe some egg whites. I see some people cook yeah. egg whites into their oatmeal mm -hmm. so that you can't really taste it or notice that it's there. Not adding a fat. That's one option. Another option is sweet potato and a protein shake or maybe even sweet potato and some leftover steak, yeah. something like that. Yeah. What about just like whole foods? So egg whites and fruit. Is that a good combo? Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Non-fat Greek yogurt and fruit. 
That could work. Yeah. Um, you know, with, I'm not a huge Greek yogurt fan, but, um, I think before exercise, it could be fine as long as someone doesn't get any like stomach cramping from it. Why are you not a huge Greek yogurt fan? Well, there's a good portion of the population that has intolerances to dairy where it creates an inflammatory response for them. So, and I think a lot of people don't even realize some of like the subliminal symptoms of that, like nasal congestion and like nasal drip and things of that sort can be dairy intolerance type symptoms that maybe don't present as like anaphylaxis where there's is full allergy. Um, it also can create, it can increase insulin levels because dairy is insulinogenic. So for people that are dealing with insulin resistance, it can be helpful to potentially remove dairy to be able to help with getting that insulin under control. So maybe for a temporary. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I like speaking more in the temporaries because I used to be such a dairy free AIP diet, elimination diet kind of girl. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, this, I didn't have any symptoms when I was AIP and that's because yeah. I was eating five foods. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's not sustainable. It's not healthy. And one of my teachers, Claudia Keel would always tell me that a healthy human should be able to digest dairy mm-hmm. unless you are, for example, of East Asian descent, yeah. then you actually have a, a true lactose intolerance. Mm-hmm. People are actually genetically different when it comes mm-hmm. to foods and what your ancestors ate and where you, your ancestors came from in the world. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that there's not true lactose intolerance, sure. but let's say you're someone of, Mediterranean descent, your you know ancestors were eating goat cheese and chilling. You should technically be able to digest dairy if you have a strong, robust, healthy body. You're not insulin resistant. You don't have gut infection. So that's mm-hmm. the goal we want to get to. I don't want people to see dairy as the enemy, but I totally hear you on the fact that for some people it's just causing inflammation right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also a lot of it comes down to quality because if you look at like, I'm Greek, that's my heritage. And like, (laughs) if you look at how Greek yogurt, like actual Greek yogurt is made, they use old goat's milk and they use that to ferment it and create the probiotics. And then that's what creates, they don't do any straining of the way like we do with Greek yogurt here in the U S In the U S to make Greek yogurt, they add in probiotics to it, like lactobacillus to ferment it. And then they use a straining method to pull out the way. Okay. So if we go back to is like, if we can incorporate more of a traditional type of dairy, then you're okay. generally going to get a better nutritional profile from it. Like than, a kefir. Yeah, exactly. Or even like some of your goat's milk yogurts, or if you can find like a local farm that's making Greek yogurt traditionally, yeah. um, I do think that it is a more nutritious option than some of the store-bought things that are available. Okay. So we had those meal examples. Then you're going to go train. This is your resistance training day. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to go train. After training, are you kind of mimicking that carbohydrate protein from your first meal? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that could look like many different options. Um, you can have some fat there because it doesn't, we're not, you know, exercising afterwards. So it's okay if the digestion is a little bit slow. I wouldn't go crazy with a high fat meal, but you know, if you're having eggs that have the yolk in them, that can be great. There's also some research that shows that eggs with the yolk actually creates a better recovery profile than if you just do egg whites. I'm so sure. yeah, so you could do, you know, eggs with a like sourdough or gluten-free toast, mm. whatever your preference is, sweet potatoes, um, add in like some fiber, some greens if you want to, as long as it's not a crazy amount of antioxidants, you're not going to get that inhibition adaptation. Yes. That's, that's you're reminding me. You don't want antioxidants yeah. either before and after the workout. Yeah. It, it, before is okay. After is really where it can be problematic, but really the research shows that it's like, like large dose of antioxidants. So we're talking, you're using antioxidant powders, like vitamin C powders. You're taking supplementation. You're doing like a tart cherry juice concentrate. Or like an acai Things bowl. Like, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But if you're just doing a little bit of leafy greens, it shouldn't be enough to where it's in, Repeating that training adaptation. So most importantly, you're not taking your supplements around your workout. That was our other point before. Okay. I love this. I need to learn this. Mm -hmm. So I'm reiterating it. Um, and another thing that we forgot is uh, someone could totally have some toast and egg whites in the morning before they work out like a little gluten-free toast, or if you eat gluten and you get like a really well-made sourdough. I mean, maybe if it's a little bit more of a whole grain sourdough, it's digesting a little bit slower, but I'll do toast and egg whites plenty of mornings before my workout and it's great. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And then what are some other options after the workout? Maybe like a smoothie that has a little bit of fat in it, but Mm -hmm. not too many antioxidants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do a smoothie pretty much every morning because it's fast. Uh, so I throw in there like cherries and greens and a really good quality protein powder. Um, I throw in like my inositol so I can get that in. Um, and then like flax seeds and maybe a little bit of pumpkin seeds on top of it. So it does have some fat, but it's not a significant portion 
portion of fat. And um, then I use that for the uh, meal replacement. Um, another option that you could do is like a scramble of some sort where maybe you're using a ground meat of some sort rather than eggs. So you could do a ground turkey, for example, is a pretty low fat protein, Love. has just a little bit of fat in there, right? To kind of help provide a little bit of satiety. You could pair that with a winter squash with a root vegetable to get your carbohydrate, add in a little bit of like some onions or greens for just a little bit of some fiber, mix all that together, right? And that could be a great breakfast option too. We have the pre-workout and the post-workout, like true breakfast or brunch. Mm -hmm. Now that we're past that recovery window, what are our other two-ish meals going to look like? Yeah. So we know that if you want to support muscle, you want to build muscle, you need to be hitting the muscle protein synthesis threshold, which essentially is getting in adequate protein every three to five hours. When you're resistance training, that's the frequency of how your body is breaking down muscle and getting into really like a catabolic state. And that's when your body needs that protein source. So the research shown that that's about 0.3 grams per kilogram body weight, which that's a lot of like an equation for most people that comes out to about 30 grams of protein mm-hmm. and per meal per meal. Yeah. So we really need to be hitting hitting that threshold every three to five hours to be able to support this process. And I think it's great because not only do you get that benefit of the muscle piece of it, but protein is also really important for satiety. It also helps insulin sensitivity. So that's where the like sports and the functional side really cross again, right? Is that we can focus on protein timing and it can provide us so many benefits. So if you're having breakfast, say after your workout, you get done at 9am, then if we're thinking about that three to five hour rule, then we want to be having our next meal within, you know, by maybe 1pm and that next meal should have other components, but it should definitely make sure that it's hitting that protein threshold of about 30 grams. Someone who has higher cortisol and they want to bring that post-workout cortisol down pretty quickly, should Mm -hmm. they be eating soon after their workout and maybe doing more small meals per day? Yeah. So the research shows that it's more important to focus on that every three to five hours. And it matters more for the cortisol piece if you haven't eaten prior to the workout or if you haven't eaten eaten a great amount. So if someone's just had like a little fruit pouch or something prior, I would definitely say, yes, get in that meal within 30 minutes of that workout to bring down that cortisol response. If you had like a full breakfast, you've probably got a little bit more of a window of opportunity to be able to get that breakfast in because that cortisol response was already a bit blocked by just having adequate carbohydrate prior to that workout. So I'm guessing you're not a fan of a fasted workout. No. (laughs) Enough said. We're not even going to go into that. Okay. So then the other two meals in the day, we said we wanted to focus on antioxidants, diversity, fiber, and a little bit more healthy fats. So what do those other meals of the day look like? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of four feedings or meals, snacks, however you want to pair that throughout the day. I think that that's essential. If you're trying to hit that muscle protein target of that 30 grams every three to five hours, then you need to be having four feedings at some point. Right. So for most, that's three meals and a snack somewhere broken up where you're going to be going more than five hours. Uh, So say that you're having lunch at one o'clock and that lunch, again, we're going back to it should have some carbohydrates in there because remember those carbohydrates, they are going to provide a little bit of that cortisol reducing effect. They are going to help to be able to support our thyroid hormone activity, but they should be a smaller amount. It should be maybe a handful portion. And the meal focus should really be get your protein, get tons of antioxidants through the vegetables you're eating, flood it with anti-inflammatory fats, do it again three to five hours later, and then maybe do it again one more time. So the the last two feedings of the day, whether they're meal or snacks, are going to be a bit higher in fat, lower in carb than your first two feedings that are around your resistance training workout that are higher in carb, lower in fat. Correct. Beautiful. Now, what about our other day, which is the zone two, Mm -hmm. um, you know, hour walk, 30 minutes walk. Yeah. Yeah. So with zone two exercise, if someone is in a hormonally healed state, I like to say it, they might be able to get away with doing that exercise fasted because there's no cortisol response that's happening and your body shouldn't be using carbohydrate for energy because you shouldn't be at a high enough intensity. However, I don't recommend it for women that are still healing. If there's still hormone imbalances at play, your body's going to be much more sensitive to these stressors. And it's a better idea to just eat prior to that type of exercise. So that's where it really does depend, right? The benefit of doing it fasted is that you do get a little bit more of that mitochondrial biogenesis. So you do get some more benefit to that mitochondrial function. Um, But 
it's not worth it if it's going to impact your hormones in the process, right? So really that day shouldn't look very different than your resistance training day. The only difference to me is that we don't need as much of that carbohydrate protein focus around more of these aerobic workouts because they shouldn't be, as long as you're in the right zone, they shouldn't be requiring uh, any carbohydrate really for energy to be able to fuel these type of exercises. So you just kind of want to eat a balanced diet on that other day. You want to do your four feedings, hitting at least 30 grams of protein for each of those feedings, which is amazing because you'll end up with 120 grams of protein, which is so ideal for most women. Um, And you want to have a pretty good balance of carbs, fat, and protein in each of those meals. So you don't have to overdo it. Can you give us some tangible examples of meals and snacks that you do on those days? So, I mean, it could look similar to what we talked about. Maybe it's just that instead of doing the oatmeal like you would on a strength training day, you're just going straight into like eggs with vegetables and fruits and avocado for breakfast. And then lunch is a salad. I'm a huge fan of legumes. If you can tolerate them, I think they're a really great option for people to get that soluble fiber in. Um, So you could do a salad that has leafy greens, arugula, great bitter vegetable, add in some legumes, add in a little bit of some chicken or other type of animal protein source, and then a bunch of all olive oil, pumpkin seeds, whatever it might be for an anti-inflammatory fat. Um, Your snack, I would say really make sure that you're at minimum getting in a protein source. Some people need more than that. It just depends on your energy needs. But I would say that nonetheless, at least a protein source there so that you can really still support that muscle protein synthesis threshold that we're talking about. So that could be something as simple as like a protein shake or a couple of like no sugar jerky sticks. If you can tolerate those fine, some leftover protein from the day before, um, hard boiled eggs, any of those could be great options. And then your dinner would look almost identical to lunch. Again, maybe it's not a salad, maybe it's a soup where you're doing the same thing, or it's some type of bowl where it's, you know, a lot of different vegetable varieties so that you're getting in all the sulfur and these leafy greens for antioxidants and things. Um, but you're also getting in maybe a more hearty protein source like salmon or bone in chicken where you're getting in a little bit more of these, like this glycine and collagen in there. Right. Um, and then utilizing another anti-inflammatory fat like uh, avocado olive oil or such and you're still getting carbohydrates in each of these meals and it's actually not in the the larger proportion that you had especially around your workout the day prior so it's kind of almost like carb cycling a bit it's a bit of a lower carb day but not so much just yeah. more mindful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think carb sources too can also vary. So, and depending on like what someone's blood sugar control is and insulin sensitivity is on a non-resistance training workout day, they might not be able to do like oatmeal with breakfast and get a healthy blood sugar response from mm. that meal. It really just does depend, right? So they might need something that is maybe more of like a legume source or a root vegetable where there's a little bit more fiber. It's a little bit lower in carbohydrate and it just provides provides a little bit of a more stable blood sugar response to that meal. So you want to be a little bit more mindful of balancing your blood sugar on days that you're not resistance training. Yeah. You don't have as, as good of insulin sensitivity on those days, yes. right? So yeah. your blood sugar is going to be more affected by what you eat generally. I love that. And you can always use a tool like gluco bitters. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> blood sugar balancing pre-meal vinegar that has um, some herbs that help you to utilize the carbohydrates more effectively. You can just put a little bit of gluco bitters or even just some apple cider vinegar and a bit of water before your meal to help you utilize the carbohydrates more efficiently on the days that you're not training. I think that'd be a great, yeah, great tool for really anything that's outside of that training window where the insulin sensitivity is dropped off, especially for those more insulin resistant individuals. And then definitely on those non-resistance training days to help with that. I love that. So take your gluco bitters on your non-resistance training days, be (laughs) diligent, bring them out to eat with you if you're going to a restaurant. Okay. Amazing. Is there anything else that you want women to know, period? Like any other piece of your philosophy or a nugget of wisdom that you have to share? I think the most important thing going back to just the hormone piece of things is that hormones are never the root cause, right? Whenever there's hormone imbalances, it's a message from our body that there's imbalance in some other area. And I like to kind of think of it as like inflammation as this broad way to categorize the the why, the root cause behind that hormone imbalance. And so we want, if we're trying to really correct our hormones in a natural way that we can absolutely do through food and through lifestyle measures, we have to look at things like what's going on in the gut? How are our cells functioning? Where's our deficiency? 
deficiency of minerals, right? We have to ask these bigger questions as to why are the hormones responding this way? What's the physical and emotional side of this that's driving this imbalance? Because that's really where you're going to see the magic happen with better hormone regulation. And when you have better hormone regulation, not only do you feel better every day because hormones impact our brain function and our mood and things, but you're also going to see better results from things like your workouts that you're doing, better body composition changes because your hormones are in a better you know, balance to be able to create that environment for you to respond to that exercise more effectively. I love that. And that's the other thing I forgot to ask you. When you mentioned low progesterone before and PCOS, I always find it fascinating that in the herb world, we have phytoestrogens, we have herbs that can support your testosterone levels, but we don't have any phyto, um, progestogenic herbs. We have no herbs that can support, I mean, obviously vitamin C and B6 are nutrients that can support your progesterone, but for women out there who are struggling with low progesterone, what are some things that they can do diet and lifestyle wise? Yeah, I think vitamin C and B6 can be really helpful. Um, Chase tree berry can be helpful for some women too. That is the only herb, but it's not necessarily immediately boosting your progesterone. It's working on the HPA. Exactly. Yeah, it's going to take some time and you've got to make some other changes alongside of it for sure. Whenever someone has low progesterone levels, that's where I really go back to is like, why? And sometimes it's as simple as just looking at what's going on the week before you're supposed to be ovulating. Hmm. Like, are you creating too much of this stress response on the body? Am I telling my body that I'm safe every day through the way that I nourish myself, through the workouts I do, through the way that I sleep, the way that I like function in my day to day? Am I telling my body, am I sending those clear signals? Like this is a safe place to reproduce because if the body's not getting those clear signals, if you're like in fight or flight mode because you've got a work project or you are like under eating, whatever it might be, your body is going to, your body's constantly scanning, right? It's all a feedback loop. And if your body gets that signal, this is not a safe place to carry a baby to reproduce right here. Your body's just going to keep trying and it's going to keep pushing the ovulation back and back. And then eventually it's not going to happen. And if we don't ovulate, no progesterone is being made. We have to ovulate in order to make adequate progesterone. So sometimes it's just as simple as that is just looking at is like, what can I do that week before ovulation to really send those clear signals to my body? And you specifically want to be telling your body through your habits, we are safe. I feel safe that week before ovulation to optimize your progesterone. Yeah. Never realize that, that that, because we always think about, oh, the week before your period, you want to support liver detox to have a good period, but having a good period also involves good, healthy ovulation and progesterone levels. And it seems like from what you're saying, we have the biggest impact the week before ovulation for that. Yeah, I know. And that's where I think a lot of the cycle syncing information goes wrong is that if you follow normal cycle syncing charts, they'll tell you that's the week you should really push it on your workouts. And that might work for a woman who has really great hormonal levels. But how many of us women do? Like, I know my hormones are very sensitive. I got to keep things in tight alignment, right? (laughs) For things to to really operate as they should. Um, And so the women that aren't having that like perfect hormonal profile, none of us do, we've got to be thinking about is like, are we sending that clear signal that week before ovulation to even just tell our brain, hey, you should ovulate here. Like you should make a baby here Mm. because even just progesterone alone is going to help with PMS. So if you're having heavy periods, it's going to help with sleep. Maybe it is liver. Yeah. It's going to help with sleep, anxiety, right? All these things. So it may go back to is that we just need our body to make more progesterone. It goes back to the nervous system at the end of the day. Oh my goodness. You are a powerhouse. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this episode. Please share with everyone how we can find you, your offerings and how we can work with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And my practice is Functional Fueling and our website is functionalfueling.com. Instagram is functional.fueling. I also have a podcast called the Strength and Hormones Podcast. We kind of interplay this exercise science with the, with the hormone piece of things. So but a lot of nutrition conversation around it. So um, that's a really great place to learn more. And then if someone's like just getting started with a lot of this information, kind of feeling overwhelmed, maybe not ready to do all of the testing and the one-on-one support, we have a starting program. It's called Inflammation Hormony. Really It's really just that first step for people to take to be able to start addressing the underlying root cause of the hormonal imbalances. And that's where we start to work on things like mitochondrial function and gut function and liver health to help with that inflammation reset, if you will. And then after that, then if someone wants to pursue the one-on-one testing and the more individualized support, then that's where they can definitely become a patient. Or if someone wants to just jump into that, they're like, I don't really need that starter. Like I've already done a lot of that. I'm at the place where I'm just feeling so defeated 
defeated. I've seen a lot of, you know, functional practitioners in the past or whatever it might be. Then we have our one-on-one program where we do all of the advanced testing. We customize that to the patient of what are the answers we're trying to find? You know, I think it's so important that we don't just go get testing done. We really do testing that's going to answer the questions that we can't give with just looking at someone's diet and lifestyle. Because right? you can look at a lot with, with just someone's, what their body is telling you. And often people, yeah. even when you're in a session with a client, you hear through their own words, they like where the problem is coming from. They actually know what the root cause issue is and they just don't realize it, but you can hear it through their language. Yeah. A lot of times you can, and testing is great. It's one of my favorite tools, I think for one of my favorite things I think about testing, and I know you this will resonate with you because of your history, but is that I think it takes away that like nutrition dogma. Like it takes away some of the, um, like the, you know, telling everyone that carbs are bad or telling everyone that um, fat is bad, right? Because it really t- gives you the information you need to be like, my body needs this carbohydrate at this time, or I need this much carbohydrate because of my thyroid hormones. It really helps to be able to kind of separate what you need versus what all of that information is that is out there that's like flooding your brain every day, right? Yeah, there's a lot of it. Yes, And you is. really cut through so much of it on this podcast. And again, the, the ultimate answer is work with someone one-on-one. That's, yeah. that's the deepest way we can support you. These podcast episodes are so valuable, but nothing beats that relationship. So um, absolutely, I'm so excited for people to work with you. Thank you again for coming on the show. You rocked it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot get over how much information Lauren just gave us. I have a notebook at home when I was editing this. I took so many notes and I've implemented so many of her tips already, like taking omegas far away from my exercise plan. And she is just a wealth of knowledge. And I'm so excited for more scientific episodes like this. As a reminder, if you want to shop any of the formulas that we talked about throughout this episode, like ThyroPro, Bloat BFF, Gluco Bitters, or my Mighty Minerals tincture that can really help with some of those mineral gaps in our diets that we talked about in the show, you can go to organiclivia.com and use code HORMONES15 for 15% off any of those formulas until April. See you next time. Great.